everybody. So it's two o'clock. We will start our technical webinar on Birded Vulture, on the Birded Vulture project. So good afternoon, everyone. It's a great to honor for me to open this webinar. Unfortunately, we can't see who is sitting now in the audience, but I know there are many friends who worked with us for a long time for the protection and the restoration of the bearded vulture populations in Europe. So uh, welcome to you all. Under normal circumstances, uh, we would now meet uh, in a hotel lobby or have an animated conversation in front of a congress hall. Uh, this year, unfortunately, this is not possible. In the next days, we would uh, engage in very diverse and stimulating activities. So we really miss to have not this opportunity this year. Uh, for this webinar, we have received more than 350 registrations. And probably many more interested vulture friends will follow this meeting in social media. So we are very pleased about this great interest. The advantage of the virtual setting of our conference is of being able to exchange uh, ideas and results with a much lar larger audience. So, and among them, are many vulture experts from all over the world. Uh, so I think that's a benefit of this setting. Uh, and we certainly also have many visitors who are not directly involved in vulture protection up so far, but who have a great interest and may be involved in vulture protection in one form or another in the future. So maybe by helping us in an observation day, Mirko will tell more about this, or by supporting us with donations. So uh, on the behalf of the entire team of the Vulture Conservation Foundation, I would like to welcome you all warmly uh, for joining this webinar. Why do we have this webinar? So behind this, uh, we have a history of over 100 years. Uh, unlike in other regions, many of you know that, uh, the bearded vulture had a very bad reputation in the Alps. Ignorance has led to its description as a real beast that not only preys on lambs, but as you can see on this picture, even of children. Uh, thus, within a few decades, the bearded vulture was acti actively eradicated in the Alps, also with the support of public funds. So in 1913 is the last documented shooting of a bearded vulture in the Alps. In the 60s, uh, there was more and the idea grown, was growing to bring back the bearded vulture to the European Alps. And in the 70s, a breeding program was started to establish a base, the basis for the Alpine reintroduction project. Finally, the first reintroduction into the wild took place in 1986 in the National Park Hohe Tauern in Austria. Today, 35 years later, we have over 50 breeding pairs in the Alps, but the project still continues. Uh, as we will see in the next presentations, the project is very successful. In fact, it's widely seen as a one of the most successful reintroduction projects worldwide. In many aspects, it is also seen as a blueprint for other projects and uh, the key factors for the success are certainly, uh, is certainly a highly coordinated approach, strong partnerships, and a strat strategic planning across uh, the different countries. Therefore, maintaining long-term partnerships and working in central is a central concern of our foundation. Uh, therefore. We are happy that we can hold this event despite of the Corona crisis. 
as we will see in the next presentation, uh, uh, the, the last year we had uh, huge successes also in the last year, despite the challenge of the Corona crisis. This was uh, only possible with the great support of all our partners and the commitment of our team. So I'm very happy uh, that we can see now the results. Uh, it's also very nice that today in this format we have can have friends from South Africa and from Nepal, Nepal with us who can report on their work with Peter Vultures in their regions. So a warm welcome also to you, uh, Sonia, Shannon and Tulsi. Before we start, I would like to make some short remarks. During the session, you will have a button uh, for questions and answers. Please use this button if you have any question. Francisca and Luis will go th through these questions, answer them, uh, a part of them directly in the chat, and also uh, bring them to the discussion in our discussion session. We will also have very short polls. Please take part. This is very important for us that we, we have a short feedback from you. Uh, last but not least, please also consider for the people who, who are not deeply involved in our project, uh, this uh, meeting is also for our partners. So in some parts, maybe the content of the lectures is a bit very specific and not for the general audience, but we tried to make the, the talks as generalized as possible. So Alex, now it's time to start with our first session. As most of the audience probably know, breeding is a absolutely central element. And so I hand over the word to Alex, who is the coordinator of the uh, Bearded Vulture EEP and is the key por person to advise all persons who are involved in the breeding or in the breeding network of Bearded Vulture. Alex, I look, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Before exposing the final results, I would like to give you a short overview of the structure of the EP for better understanding how the results are presented. 40 years breeding this species in captivity, we know their formation with adult birds can be really difficult at the point of killing each other. That's why we distinguish between breeding centers where these are institutions where they receive already parent birds or young birds with the goal to produce descendants and a specialized in breeding centers, from which we have three large ones in red spots and two small ones in green spots, and all together are holding 181 birds. In the following table, we can see the results distributed according to the type of breeding centers, so specialized breeding centers, where we include zoos, private collections, and recovery centers. Together, we had 41 breeding pairs, which produced 71 eggs, from which 53 were fertile. From them, 38 hatched and 25 survived. If we compare with the results from last year, we can see a significantly increase on number of fertile eggs, but a lower number of survivor chicks. So we have lost a potential of 13 chicks. From these 13 losses, two it happened during the hatching process, 
you can see here an example, one six, which died during the hatching process when the yolk sac was still not absorbed. Three of them during the adoption process, it's a very sensitive period. Adult birds can react aggressively against the chicks and eight more during the rearing period. If we compare also with the results from last year, we can see there is a significantly difference on the losses on rearing. And this higher losses on rearing is due principally because of the COVID-19 restrictions. We suffered a reduction of staff to the minimum necessary, being not able to monitor 100% the rearing process of the chicks by the parents of foster pairs. We could not transfer chicks for adoption to experienced foster pairs, being necessary to adopt them by unexperienced birds. This made necessary to recover all breeding protocols and adapt them to the latest knowledge, so double or triple adoptions, NESPOC, rearing, and all that had to be done in the middle of the pandemic restrictions. As you can imagine, that was really, really difficult. And we really suffered the biggest crisis since these programs exist. I will see, for example, uh, Berlin Zoo, they did they additionally built additional nests. Or, for example, Green Balkans, they had uh, split the nest in two, giving the possibility to include this one all adoption. Marco Natura Biba, where the birds stopped to incubate, it was necessary to build the next box, giving the chip the possibility to have visual contact with adult birds. And all that had to be done in the last moment. However, with all these adversities, 25 chicks survived, from which four could be included in the captive network, three males and one female and 21 have been used for reintroduction projects for four on the five ongoing projects. With these additional 25 chicks produced in 2020, the number of successful raising juveniles has increased to 585, from which 344 have been used on different reintroduction projects. From this 585, 244 have been produced in the breeding centers, zoos, private collections, and recovery centers, and 341 in the specialized breeding centers. Back to the breeding results. This year, three pairs have produced for the first time a hatchling, and one of them, Berlin Zoo pair, its first fledgling. One pair has produced for the first time a clutch, and two pairs for the first time was observed by matting. On the other hand, we have lost three birds. One special in a female from Goldau Zoo, 20, 23 years old. She stuck her beak in the ring and donated in the water basin. Another bird which died because of a spagulosis in Richard Faust Centrum. And the third one in Zoo Botanical Health, a male which died because of West Nile virus. I would like to remark Aspergillosis and West Nile virus are the two diseases that cause the most death in this species in captivity. On the other hand, six new birds could be included in DP. Four coming from the captive breeding, three males and one female. One bird which suffered an accident in the hacking side. He had an open fracture, where you can see here in the X-ray. And uh, this, the last bird, which is a Pyrenean bird, which suffered an accident last year, fell from the nest and injured the tail feathers, particularly damaged the follicle of the central tail feathers, which provoke a twisted row of them. This bird has been released several times without success, and each time, two weeks later, has been found really weak. 
every year a new Perry concept is edited with all EP partners follow it with the goal that all birds are producing descendants. This year was foreseen to transfer nine birds, from which four have been already done thanks to staff from Prague Zoo. They traveled middle of September until South Spain covering more than 5,000 kilometers. And, and thanks to them, we could transfer three males and one female between by Kalen Astaire's Zoo. And we hope in the coming weeks we can transfer the five pending birds. In 2020, only one uh, center expressed the wish to join us, Halle Zoo from Germany. So I would like to express they are really warm and welcome. And two other expressed the wish to enlarge their housing capacity zoos which are already included in the Birded Vulture EEP. So Nuremberg Zoo would like to build two additional areas outside from the public and Park Animal the Pyrenees would like to build a specialized breeding center with a capacity of 14 areas. I would like to remind you that this international captive breeding program is the basis of the most Birded Vulture introduction projects in Europe. What really our partners want to know is the expectation for the coming years to know if they will receive birds next year and how many. Nevertheless, our first priority is to ensure in long term the viability of the EP. And this is achieved by ensuring long term genetic variability and by maintaining a stable demographic population. And how we do that? The first four descendants of each founder are included in the EP, and we try to reproduce which every new founder. And the shape age distribution should look like a pyramid. So the final goal is to ensure a minimum number of annual breeding pairs which produce the minimum number of chicks for satisfying the EEP and their introduction project needs. And to maintain this goal, we must keep an eye on the age of the breeding birds. So actually we have 23 birds which are 30 or more years old, from which 19 are breeding birds and are passed from 14 breeding pairs, which that represent more or less a third of the breeding pairs which have breed in 2020. So we can expect in the coming years that some of these birds will be no more present and will lose breeding pairs. That's why we need yearly to include a minimum number of producer chicks in the captive stock to ensure that every year the minimum potential of new pairs can start to reproduce and can compensate any loss. In the following table, you can see our annual forecast in potential breeding pairs. For example, in 2021, you can see we have 10 potential breeding pairs with a high probability to produce a fledgling. Four of them have already produced a hatching years before. We have also nine potential breeding pairs with medium probability that they can produce have uh, fledgling this year, and we have 16 breeding pairs with a low probability to produce a fledgling this year. So altogether, we have 40, uh, 35 breeding pairs which can produce a fledgling in the coming years. We have three pairs which in one, two years will arrive to sexual maturity. Only, this is only, poss only possible of chicks in the EEP. So, so the big question is what we can expect next breeding season, having a stable, even a growing trend in number of breeding pairs. If we can compare the table and we see the results since 2015 on number of fledgling, 
we can see that we have more or less a stable production on fledged fix. We have a, a record in 2019, but unfortunately in 2020, it decreased again to usual numbers. I exposed it before, this is due because the COVID-19 consequences, some unusual circumstances. So what really we can expect for next season if all goes more or less well? If we have a look to this table, we can see the evolution of the breeding perimeters during the last 70 years. The number of breeding pairs in yellow and the number of fledgling yard, you can see there is more or less a similar positive tendency. And consequently, we can expect in the coming years more or less the same or a higher number of chicks. This is affirmed if we have also a look to the tendency of the number of eggs and particularly of the number of fertile eggs. It's also increasing substantially so some so summarizing in 2021 we'll ex we can expect a minimum number of 25 chicks even higher but nevertheless the number of available chicks for reintroduction project it will depend on different factors which changed yearly that's why yearly we have to edit a release strategy which follow several criteria which then it can also change each year. So depending on the EEP needs, on the number of descendants of new founders, of the needs of each release site, also release site sex ratio. So, but at the end, the distribution of the nesting will depend on the breeding results, being necessary to adjust the release strategy to its results. It's a dynamic, Table. Thank you very much for your attention. Many thanks, Alex, uh, for your very interesting uh, talk. Uh, it's uh, really central to see all the progresses in the uh, breeding program and to see what you and all the partners have achieved during these difficult circumstances uh, during the Corona crisis. So uh, I'd like now to introduce Mirko Lauper. Uh, apart from the breeding, the close monitoring of the release program is a really a key element for the success of the reintroductions. And the international bird mo vulture monitoring is a strong network that coordinates all monitoring activities across the involved countries. Uh, this network also ensures that all collected data is entered in the shared IBM database. Mirko Lauper, together with Katja Rauchenstein, manage this database and uh, we look forward to your contribution. Thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, hello everybody. Um, for me, it seems so great that almost more, more than 250 people are now online joining this webinar and from all over the world. And I think it's a great opportunity to present the work of the IBM the International Beard Vulture Monitoring. So, first of all, for the people who are not familiar with what, what the IBM is doing and how it is set up, I want to um, give a short introduction. It is um, 20 areas of responsibilities where partners from the IBM and associated organizations collect data within their areas. They work together with volunteers and bird specialists and hunters and game wardens. And finally, they enter the data to the database. And one really special thing about this database is that we collect data on the individual level. So for certain birds, we are able to follow these um, um, animals over their whole lifetime, which gives us a lot of uh, interesting information and allows us 
to do demographic modeling. The IBM is also uh, monitoring the reproduction. And I want to now um, go through you, uh, go through the reproduction year 2020 together with you. So what you see here on this map is a uh, just a um, short out, um, um, output of the 63 territories. And as we have said before, at the moment, it's 53 territories that have bred in 2020. And the blue pairs or territories which are highlighted here, um, in these territories, no breeding has been uh, um, reported. Some of the territories are um, surrounded with a gray outline. These are the territories where no um, breeding has been rep um, reported in the last years, so which are new breeding pairs. Um, you see here on this map that out of the 53 territories, there was a breeding failure um, in 10 of the pairs during the clutch. So for Bionats in Italy, it was the first breeding attempt, and it was also the first breeding attempt for Tinizong in Switzerland. Another six um, fledglings die or chicks died before they fledged, as you can see here on this map. And it was the first breeding attempt in Martina on the border to Switzerland and Italy. Finally, 37 beard vultures fledged in the wild, one of them on Corsica. And for the pair here, for the territory here, it was the first time um, to breed, and it was also the first successful reproduction in the Bernese Alps. So when we look at the number of 37 fledglings compared to 16 failures, one might think that this is a considerable high number. However, when you look at this over the last years, we see that there is a steady increase of breeding territories with an increase of failures. But looking at this relatively, we see that in the last 10 years, the breeding failure rate is decreasing and is varying between 40 and 20% which is considerably higher, uh, lower than in the Pyrenees, which has been shown in a recent paper by Marga Arlida et al. Another characteristic of the Alpine population is that mo many or most of the um, reproduction is happening in the core areas, in the central part here in blue, or in the um, Northwestern Alpines in red, Whereas there is little reproduction in the eastern parts of the Alps and the southwestern parts of the Alps. You see this pattern also on this map, which is the, showing all the breeding territories with success in green and failure in red of the last year. What we see here is clearly a pattern of where birds have been released in the last years. And there is still gaps, as you can see highlighted here. And um, birds are still released in this uh, area. Uh, until the last year and, and further on. And it's planned to release birds in Berchtesgaden National Park up here in Germany, which is the first time that it's, it's gonna be released in this area to enforce the Eastern um, uh, bearded vulture population, Eastern Alpine bearded vulture population. So talk about releases, I think in the beginning, I want to, um, Again, for the people who are not familiar with the strategy of the VCF to introduce what's the idea behind. Um, here you see the Alpine population I was talking about before and the recent populations of bearded vultures here in the Pyrenees, in Andalusia, Corsica, North Africa, Greece and Eastern Europe. And the idea is that with the release of birds, for example, in uh, Melksefrut, in Baroni and Vercor, as well as in Casorla, these local populations are enforced. While with releases in the so-called stepping stone areas in Grand Cos, in the Massif Central and in Maestrasco, the idea is to connect these three populations in order to form a Europe-wide metapopulation of bearded vultures. The long-term goal is then to connect these, this uh, metapopulation with the populations in North Africa and in the Eastern. Something I really think is uh, worth to highlight is that um, we're working with individual base data in the IBM. And all the birds that, we, that are released are marked with um, bleached feathers. So with individual wing patterns that can be um, recognized for a certain amount of time, but are really good visible. 
and with rings, which last for a long time and can help to identify, for example, a dead animal, and GPS tags that allow us to follow animals very closely and to see how they are moving in space. This year, and in the last few years, more and more effort is put into um, marking wild fledglings. With the increase of this uh, wild population, it becomes more important to see what these birds are doing. And some of our partners put a lot of effort in marking six um, wild hatchlings in 2020 with rings and GPS. And now we are able to follow them, as you can see here on this map. To follow these animals so closely becomes really an important thing when we talk about dropouts. And I will go into detail now a bit about this. On this map, you see the summary of the dropouts that have been reported in the last year. With dropouts, we are talking about mortalities, when birds die, so they are lost for the population, when birds have to be recaptured, as in the case of Suro, where the bird had a um, wing fracture and could not be released again, but will stay in captivity until it's either possible to release him again or um, use it for the breeding um, population, in the captive breeding population. In three other cases, birds had to be reca uh, recaptured again because they were weak or injured and they could recover and released again to the population. So you see here in this last year, we had three juveniles, uh, three wild hatched birds with the gray label that had to be, or there were reported as dropouts and seven released birds. To find a, a bird on time is really an important thing. And I will dis, uh, discuss this now on the case of Ptolemy. The team in the Massive Central was um, alerted due to um, GPS data and went to the field and what they found was a dead bird. And they could investigate this bird and found some lead bullets into the body, in the body, which made sure or which revealed that this bird was shot. So it was an anthropogenic threat to this bird. In another case here in the genotype 175, and a so far unknown bird, where only few feathers were found. And it was hard or it was impossible to find out if this bird was killed by the collision with this power line here just a few uh, meters away. So to find the bird on time is really important and that's why close monitoring is an important thing in the IBM monitoring. To my take home um, message, I think it's really important to understand that the IBM internet yeah, the IBM is a keystone of the success of this project. And we really, um, thanks to this monitoring, we can follow the development of the, of the, of the population and also identify threats of these um, birds. With the focus on individual identification, we can get parameters which are important for later on the, um, modeling the population and for, yeah, for demographic modeling. So the focus on marking is one of the key, key features of the IBM. Then a collaborative network, which is working without or over political borders is a big, big advantage when working with a wide ranging species, such as the bearded vultures. And the IBM is based on a lot of personal commitment of IBM partners, field assistants, game wardens, ornithologists, volunteers, researchers, and many, many more people. So it wouldn't be possible without these people working together in the field or in the office and making the IBM possible. So a big thanks to all the partners and to the funding of this project. Um, and now I want to give the word over to um, our IBM partners from Alpi Maritime and Alpi Cozie and give the word to Fabiano. Okay. Hello to everybody. I am Fabiano Saltirana and uh, I speak uh, as a responsible technician of Badevarch Monitoring for Alpi Maritime Natural Park. I'm very honored to speak today at this uh, very important uh, appointment. 
the Alpi Maritime Natural Park together with uh, the Alpi Cozze Natural Park coordinates the monitoring of the species in Piemonte, collecting and uploading in the ABM database all the bird vulture observations. About the, the most important results of uh, the last year, there is the confirmation of the Mayra Valley territory, uh, a territory in the province of Cuneo in Alpi Maritime, uh, where uh, the, the uh, pair is formed uh, by Roman, mail released in Alpi Maritime sites in uh, 2015, and still equipped uh, by GPS. And so it's very, very important date, data for the very long period. And the other uh, individual is a subadult and uh, who have uh, been observed several times to take branches in historic nest. And so it's very, very important uh, uh, news. The, the other uh, important things is uh, the Ocelio pair in Turin of province, and so in the north of Piemonte. Also this year, uh, there was a second case of reproduction with the suchas. Is the second. It's very, very, very important uh, news. Uh, the bird of uh, was born is a uh, name uh, Mauric, and the last year is uh, Belavri. This year, the UD in Piemonte on uh, 3 October 2020. It's very important in Piemonte because we have served 12 and 13 uh, bird vulture and it's a very important uh, data number uh, from the start of a project of reintroduction in our region. Thanks a lot for your attention. Many thanks, Fabiano and Mirko, for your talks. Uh, it's always amazing to see on which detailed level we have data on, bird, on the bird vulture populations, which are monitored in the framework of the IBM. So uh, many thanks for this. Uh, beside the collection of occasional sightings and the close surveillance of the breeding pair, we have heard that the GPS loggers uh, make an important contribution, but also the monitoring of the genetics is really essential for the reintroduction project. So I'm very happy to introduce Franziska Lörcher, who is scientific and conservation coordinator of the Vulture Conservation Foundation and who did already her master's thesis with the genetics of the bearded vulture in the Alps. Uh, she will give us an update about these two aspects of our monitoring, GPS data and genetic monitoring. Francisca, we look forward to your talk. Um, many thanks, everyone. Um, as we already heard from Mirko, um, we are working with individuals, and I'm going to present to you some special individuals uh, which are, we could monitor in the last one, two years and did some, some exciting things. And this is, of course, as, as Mirko already, as we already mentioned, not my work, but this is the work of a group of people of course, which are gathered in this International Bearded Vulture Monitoring in the IBM. So it's all our joint effort. We have heard that we mark all released bearded vultures with a small uh, GPS tags, um, which you can see here on, on the back of, of this bird, um, and which enable us to follow them through their lifetime or through the lifetime of the GPS tag moreover. And then we just see how, how groups of birds um, from the different population actually move. We see here 
a division between the origin of this bird. So we have, for example, in yellow, the birds which are released or wild hatched in the Alps. Blue is the pre-Alps. Um, and they kind of move together. They, they mingle um, and also move away from the mountain areas, um, but kind of very little fly towards the west, towards the, the Massif Central or even the Pyrenees. On the other hand, we have the Pyrenees, which is here only one single bird. So that's not representative, but this special bird stayed in the Pyrenees and did not move around. We then have in purple, um, all the birds released in the Massif Central. And we see also they make big movements to the north. Some of them join the Pyrenean population. Some of them join the Alpine population. So basically birds released in that area, do their function and move to the other massives. Um, what we also see is that we have a population of Corsica from released and wild-born birds, which did not actually move away from the island or um, no one moved to Corsica. And we're actually going to have a look, closer look at two um, birds or three birds here. Um, one of them is here, uh, these points in the northern uh, Apennine in Italy, and the other is um, this point here on Corsica. We will first go zoom in on Corsica a bit, and what we really see, the birds there move most of Corsica, mainly the northern part, a um, little bit in the south, but none of them actually left the island for good, so none of them flew to the to the mainland uh, Italy or France. And when we zoom in further, we actually have a nice surprise this summer that all of a sudden one of the birds released last year, Sintu, moved away from Corsica, crossed the sea, reached Capraia Island here, even continued a little bit um, in direction to, to the uh, Elba Island, but turned around halfway, moved back to Capraia, spent the night there, and flew back to Corsica. So far, we had only observations, for example, from, Gre from um, Greece islands that bearded vultures have been observed, but it was never recorded so far with GPS data that these bearded vultures uh, cross over the sea. And you can imagine that crossing the sea for a bearded vulture is not the most appealing thing. It's a big bird, there's nowhere to land. And the distance here is um, was 42 kilometers. The direct distance to the mainland would be 150 to 200 kilometers. So these stepping stones might really help. And even more surprisingly, uh, in the very same year, just a couple of weeks later, the second bird, which was released last year as well, also flew to Kaprai Island and turned back around. So we now know they can find their way, they cross the sea and they might even make their way uh, via uh, island, the Elba Island, uh, at some point to Italy. The second story of the bird is this poor fellow, uh, which was recorded in central France in mid-May this year. It was then quickly transferred to Hegalaldi, a rescue center. Um, as it was weak, it had garbage in its stomach, it was um, very thin. Um, and, and the team there took good care of the bird. Um, and actually, the bird got quite soon, it, it got better and better. And, and it was kind of sure that we could, it was possible to, to release the bird again. Now, however, as this bird didn't have any rings, uh, no GPS tag, nothing, we had no clue where it comes from to take a proper decision where we actually should release the bird in the Alps, in the Pyrenees, in Andalusia, in Maestrasco, wherever, on Corsica, wherever you can, can imagine, um, all the options uh, there are. So Egaldia took a, a blood sample um, from, from the bird. It was then analyzed with microsatellite markers and compared with the existing database from, from the different uh, projects, but there is no much in the database. Luckily, it was possible to do parentage analysis and the genotype 8 and genotype 89 popped up as parents. And we know from our usual monitoring that this is the breeding pair from the Bakshi uh, pair in Haute-Savoie in France. 
Um, based on plumage, the bird was aged uh, to, to have fledged last year. And exactly this bird from the bird from last year, um, there is no genotype in the database. So we could identify that Piero is actually uh, the bird which was rehabilitated. We then decided to release the bird close to, to where it fledged uh, in terms of, of mountain massive and the Parc Naturel Régional du Vercors was in July just taking busy and taking care of the freshly released birds and therefore it was decided to release Piero there as well as um, the team was there on the ground, the monitoring was in place etc to make sure that any difficulties, any any op, any things could um, be checked on the bird. It was of course equipped with a GPS tag, rings, etc., and um, released. And no, Piero didn't stay where we thought he might, but he crossed the Rhone Valley again, spent the summer uh, north of the Massif Central, a place where we usually see some birds passing, but not not staying over summer. And then 19th of September, it crossed back over the Rhone Valley to the Alps, um, but that's not where he stopped, but he continued into the northern Apennine um, here in Italy, which is only the second bird actually um, being recorded there by GPS data. And after that, Piero crossed the Po area, moved back to the Alps, northern Italy, um, where other bearded vultures are. It he still sounds of, of normal or usual and higher density populations, but basically back in, in the natural habitat of, of bearded vulture. So what we see with these two examples, with this example, that birds move around, they move big distances, but they also have this tendency to, to move back. Now, the second bird I'm going to in introduce to you is Vigo. Um, you all might know Vigo already. Vigo is the famous bird roaming the UK this summer. The first observation happened actually in the Netherlands, uh, end of May, and from the 19th of June onwards, when it was observed in Belgium, this unique shape of the tail was very remarkable. It lost some feathers along the way, which made it really easy to then recognize the bird, which was first observed in the UK on the 25th of June. Um, so. It, it helped to monitor the bird, this unique natural um, feature of, of it. It then spent all of summer and even into fall in the UK. And it has been last seen on the 15th of October on the south coast of, of England, starting to cross the channel. And um, that's the last certain observation we have from Vigo. But luckily, um, a week later or so, we received these observations uh, from birds in central France and also uh, eastern France, where we believe, based on plumage, it's a quite a good chance that this is same bird as Vigo. So we are relatively sure that it made made it back to to the Alps, to to the area where where it originates. We know that it originates from the Alps because up in the UK, uh, two small feathers were found. And with the same methods as for Piero, we were able to this to figure out that the bird is from the French Alps. It's a female, and it also hatched last year. Um, however, the remaining details, all of its family story, um, I cannot reveal today. Um, but we published an article which is accepted in British Birds, which will um, be available in a couple of weeks. So um, keep. Keep following this and um, you will receive more information about Vigo. Um, I mentioned feathers and, and this um, already, and these are just to go into more details about this movement and, and the connection, the metapopulation uh, theme we actually mentioned already is what we actually need is natal dispersal, meaning that birds breed somewhere else where they fledged. And what we see is here are a couple, seven examples of birds which either moved um, big distances or smaller distances um, between their fletching area in triangles or their territorial breeding areas uh, in, in circles. Uh, and I'd like to point to two birds, spe especially that's one of them is Linky, a bird which was marked, in the, marked and ringed in the nest here in the Haute-Savoie 
uh, which actually just spread across the border in the Ulster Valley, um, together with the bird released in, in central Switzerland, um, actually moved very little. And the second bird is Rimani, uh, an interesting story where this chick, this, this bird fledged in, in the Stelvio National Park. It was then territorial for a couple of months at the release site um, in central Switzerland where a small feather was found and the bird could be identified. And then in the end, it is now territorial here in the south of France in the Mercantour National Park. It moved actually quite a large distance um, between fletching and, and um, breeding area. So to conclude, what we see, what we already, what we have seen is we have observations of large movements, of big movements, of big movements in all the directions, even to areas not normally colonized or not where normally birds are not, bearded vultures are not living. We have seen that bearded vultures are able to cross the sea. So this is good news if we want to connect populations like North Africa or Corsica. Um, what we also see based on GPS data only we would estimate a very little connectivity between populations and more flying out and coming back. And only natal dispersal distances can tell us uh, where ge genetic exchange will also happen. And in the end, when we will be actually able to reestablish this metapopulation uh, we are aiming for. And thank you for your attention and um, thank you everyone for attending that meeting. Uh, many thanks, Francisco, for this very interesting talk. Uh, it's very nice to see how this careful monitoring with the GPS logger and the genetic marker, markers contributes uh, to the evaluation of how a meta, meta population can establish uh, in Europe. Uh, it's a pleasure to give now the word to our director, Jose Tavares. As already mentioned, a careful and internationally coordinated planning of the releases is a key element for the success of these reintroduction programs. Uh, depending on the results in the fields and on the development in the breeding stock and also on genetic considerations, the releases have to be adapted year by year to optimally realize the objectives of the release programs. So we are curious to hear your talk about the planning of the next release sessions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Danny. Uh, we are running about ten minutes late, so I will try to be really brief to try to recover some of the uh, some of the, the lost ground. And what I would really like to try to explain is how do we choose where to release uh, to, to release the birds? We certainly don't write to Father Christmas uh, and expect a Christmas present, a you know a, a, a chance Christmas present. Uh, we don't put it on a piece of paper on a hat and take the piece of paper out and uh, you know choose uh, randomly. Uh, and also, uh, we don't really uh, uh, provide birds to the people who pay more. There is really no direct uh, link between uh, the release of birds uh, and any uh, financial incentive. We follow a number of technical uh, um, criteria uh, that are very important to understand uh, and are discussed and uh, negotiated with all our partners in a very open and transparent way. And all together, we decide where this pool of birds go. As Alex has said, uh, we are coordinating this the Birded Vulture Captive Breeding Network. Um, we do this really uh, for in situ conservation. We do this for conservation purposes. We we uh, we breed birds in captivity, uh, uh, you know, mostly to or only to to release them eventually or most of them in um, in the wild because our objective is really the conservation of the birded vulture, uh, the conservation of vultures in in general. We do a very intensive genetic and demographic management 
of both the captive but also of the released uh, stock. And that's a little bit what I will try to uh, uh, show in the next um, uh, five minutes. As it has been mentioned, we now uh, have got a number of uh, ongoing uh, reintroduction or restocking projects, uh, uh, five uh, at the moment, uh, and there are others in, uh, in the pipeline. So uh, uh, how do we decide that we are going to release five birds here, four birds there, and three birds in the third, in the third project? We need to do an exercise, uh, a nearly exercise. So each year we revise um, the, the, the release strategy um, and produce uh, for, for each year a, a release strategy. And we do this together with our partners in a very uh, open and participatory way. It is really important uh, that uh, you know, everybody understands the criteria we follow. And uh, there are rules and, and, and criteria. Not everybody is happy with the outcome in the sense that most people do like more birds it's not possible to provide uh, all the birds that that people would ideally want for their reintroduction or restocking projects but it is really important that everybody uh, that the rules are the same for everybody and that everybody understands that this this criteria which are eminently technical this is um, well. The, Alex has already um, uh, shown shown these slides. You know, we have been producing um, uh, between twenty five and thirty uh, birds in the captive breeding network, of which we've been releasing in the last few years around uh, twenty birds. Uh, and in the bottom of the table, you've got our uh, uh, existing, ongoing reintroduction and restocking projects. Um, so uh, Alps, uh, the Grand Cos. Uh, Maestrasgo and Andalusia in Spain. These are the four introduction projects, and then uh, the restocking project in um, in Corsica. In the future, we think we uh, will be able to provide all of these projects with birds, but probably even uh, uh, new projects uh, with uh, with birds. This is because the evolution, as Alex has said, the evolution of the, the of the captive breeding stock is is very positive and, and gives lots of very good perspectives. In 2015, we had only 35 laying pairs. Last year, we had 41. And as Alex has said, um, there are an additional 35 potential pairs. Image birds that are being paired, that are paired, and 16 of these uh, additional potential pairs will reach their sexual maturity in 2021. So uh, we uh, normally would see uh, an increase in the number of eggs, in the number of hatchings that will, produ that will be produced from this. And we need to take this in into account when planning the release strategy for 2021 and also for 2022. We need to make sure that the, the needs of the captive breeding network are, um, uh, you know, are secured. Um, we need a, a number of uh, young pairs to, uh, to, to, to be established and to stay within the EP to compensate for losses and mortality. A number of our breeding birds are relatively old. They will certainly die over the next few years. So we need to make sure that uh, uh, we, we've got the long-term sustainability of the captive stock. And also there is a little bit of an imbalance in the EP, as Alex has mentioned. Um, in particular, we, we need males and, if possible, males from less common bloodlines. What is really important to know is that some of our criteria are genetic. Uh, some of the, uh, well, the Alpine uh, reintroduction project in particular, from a demographic point of view, is, 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 is finished in the sense that the demography of the population of the Alps does not need, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the reintroduced birds uh, to evolve. Um, the number of birds fledging from wild nests in the Alps is higher and, and, and sufficient to secure a, a very good demographic evolution of that population. However, the, the genetic composition of that population is still a little bit, um, uh, you know, more fragile than what would be expected from a natural population of the same uh, size. And this is understandable because all of those birds came from a, a relatively small number of founding birds that were then uh, reintroduced in the Alps over the last 30 years. So in the Alps, what we really want to do is to really finish that project, is to increase the genetic diversity. And therefore, in the Alps, what we are doing is we are releasing specific individuals uh, with a very rare and unique genetic makeup. So it's not quantity, it's quality and it's genetic quality to try to, to increase that genetic diversity. 
Our next uh, reintroduction project is going to be in the Balkans. Uh, that is going to be our uh, sixth or fifth new reintroduction project, sixth project using captive bred birds. And therefore, it's also of our interest to strengthen the uh, population of birded vultures in the eastern part of the Alps. And, and this uh, um, justifies the selection of a new release site this year, which has been mentioned by Mirko in, uh, in, uh, in Bavaria. We only can start new birded vulture uh, reintrodu uh, uh, reintrodu reintroduction projects if we have the resources available, meaning birds uh, to, to, to be provided, not in one year, not in two years, but in the medium to long term. And therefore, we are very careful when committing our birds, but we can say that uh, given the EEP development, we can provide birds uh, in the, you know, starting in the next four to five years, to the Balkans and in particular Bulgaria to start our next reintroduction, uh, reintroduction project. What is really important is that uh, these birds uh, that are introduced in the wild need to survive. More than the quantity is the survival rate and the mortality. And therefore we only start a reintroduction project and we, we only continue our introduction project if all the threats affecting the species are mitigated uh, to a maximum extent, and if mortality is really low. Uh, if, uh, you know, there's no point in releasing birds if they're going to get killed by shooting, by poisoning, by lead, or by electrocution. And therefore, quite a lot of work is put before the reintroduction starts, but also during the reintroduction to make sure that those, those threats are minimized. So this is really our release strategy. These are a little bit the criteria that we use uh, in order to divide the birds available among the different project sites. Um, we, we need to work with different scenarios because, uh, you know, as we've very well seen uh, this year with COVID, things change radically. There is also West Nile virus, aspergillosis, difficulties in transport. So we need, to, to, we need to, to, to work with different scenarios because we need to prepare these releases in a very careful way. Partners need to get resources, get people, uh, um, create a certain structure on the ground because these releases are very well prepared uh, and, and, uh, you know, and then are resource heavy. Uh, and therefore, uh, we, we, uh, we really try to plan it to a maximum and we divide the release strategy in a bad year, a normal year, a good year, and an exceptional year. What we expect is really the, the release to, um, uh, to, I mean, the, the, this year to be either a good year or a, 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 an exceptional year. So we expect to release between 19, 20 to 24, 25 birds in, in our five reintroduction restocking projects um, divided as uh, it shows in the table. Now, this table has been um, shared uh, discussed and analyzed with all our IBM partners and with the release partners on the ground. Uh, everybody understands the rules of the game. Uh, the rules of the game are exactly the same for, uh, for everybody. Um, so that if there are issues, problems, questions, uh, uh, th those are uh, addressed in a very open and transparent way with all the projects. So this is the, this is the way really that we release the birds between um, uh, the different uh, reintroduction uh, project. Now, obviously we need, to, uh, we need to think that this table is our uh, best plan. But things can change. Things can change, you know, and COVID-19 showed how things can change radically in the world. Also, we don't really know if the birds that are going to hatch are going to be males or females. We need to have that in consideration. And as you know, we, ne we need a little bit more males for the EP, for example. In some release sites, we also need a, a, certain, a certain sex to, uh, to balance the, um, the, the, the sex uh, distribution in that uh, uh, reintroduction site. Uh, if a, a new founder couple uh, or pair it starts to breed in the captive breeding in the captive breeding network, we need to keep the first uh, the first four um, fledglings from that pair in the EP. Um, so so we need to, to adapt as we go this table, uh, and this is done again in a very transparent and open way. Alex uh, is continuously talking. I mean, the breeding season is only now starting. Uh, it will run all the way to, through to March, April. Uh, and throughout this period, the table that, that I, uh, I've just presented is continuously adapted uh, and, uh, and closely monitored by us, but also by our partners, so that they can have the maximum advance notice of any changes um, uh, of our uh, original uh, original plan. Very fast, 
but this is the end. I hope that I really convey the main message, which is the distribution of the birds um, follows some uh, clear technical uh, and biological criteria um, that are the same for all the projects and that are uh, discussed and analyzed in an open and transparent way with all our partners and with all our release projects. Thank you. Many thanks, Jose, for this very clear uh, explanation of the release strategy for the next year. Uh, so uh, we are now at the end of the first round with the talks and have now 15 minutes time for a short discussion. Francisca and Luis gathered in the meanwhile certainly a number of questions. Uh, Francisca, Luis, can you let us know which questions are the most burning ones. Yeah, we have a question for Alex, first of all. Which criteria do you use to decide which young bearded vultures are retained in the EEP as captive breeders? Yes, uh, as uh, we, I have already mentioned one, in one slide, normally, first, each four first descendants from each breeding pair is keep, kept in captivity, especially if it's a founder bird. And second, it depends also from the origin. If it's a bird from the autochton population from, the, from Europe, sometimes we are also keeping a few more to ensure this genetics information also in the captivity. Thank you. Uh, one for Mirko. Um, approximately how many people are involved in the monitoring network? Maybe, maybe a difficult question to answer. Um, and can the public submit sightings? And if so, how? For um, yeah, thanks for the question. It is indeed difficult to answer this because um, the local coordinators work together with many, many peoples on the regional level. And finally, it's them that validate this data they get and decide which data has to be entered. Like this, we can guarantee the quality of the data and this makes it easier to um, coordinate the whole database. One has to say that we, every year in October, we have an International Weird Watcher Monitoring Day. And this is a great opportunity where volunteers can join the monitoring network for a one day and help to look out for birds and uh, report these observations back to the local coordinators. So in the last years, we had up to 1,000 people or more than 1,000 people joining this event. So it's really a bunch of people that are working or helping and supporting the IBM, if this answers the question. And I just added a link uh, in the chat where you can actually enter beta vulture observations which will then be distributed to the to the local um to the local partners um who will take care of them that's that's one one thing otherwise you can use your local um observ bird, observ bird observation uh, tool to actually add data but that, the link i sent is one one option you have Okay, a couple of questions for Francisca. Uh, firstly, which model or models of GPS tracker do you use? Um, and can the tracking data help to inform where to release bearded vultures in the future? Um, so we use a, nowadays solar powered um, GPS devices from, from different um, brands, depending on availability, price, budget available, etc. Um, and all our birds are marked with a leg loop harness for, for the best safety, safety of the birds. Um, they weigh between 50 and 80 grams um, altogether with VHF, with a harness, etc. Um, we use, well, what we see from the GPS data is, of course, where um, kind of um, distribution 
gaps where where bearded vultures are not present, which might help to identify um, future in introduction sites. But also more important is certainly where we see um, survival or low number of territories is also kind of an important key information to select future um, reintroduction sites. But as nowadays, uh, the majority of the birds are not tagged and not marked, but only a minority of it, the released birds, and, and most of the wild-born birds are not marked. Um, this is probably a question for, for Jose, but a general question. Uh, what preparatory actions are taken to reduce threats before release? I think Francisca's answered this in, in the Q&A, but it might be interesting to, to hear a bit more about that. Well, I mean, uh, threats are absolutely essential in any conservation project. You know, threats, threats, threats. You need to minimize threats if you are going to have a good demographic response from uh, the target populations. Uh, before a, a, a reintroduction project starts, uh, we need to do a very thorough feasibility study in which, uh, you know, all the existing knowledge, but also all the potential threats that exist to the species are thoroughly reviewed uh, and analyzed. And only if the feasibility study suggests that the threats are uh, minimal and that probably the mortality of the reintroduced birds is high, will be high, uh, do, we, uh, do we proceed? But then during the reintroduction project, because we know that things can change from one, one day to the other, uh, a new development can start, a new line can be built, uh, or birds can, can, can fly and, and then establish themselves in a certain corner where maybe a, a certain threat is, is, uh, is prevalent. We continue to monitor those, and then we, um, uh, through projects, and uh, you know, obviously subject to funding, we try to minimize those threats. So we need to keep the threats to a minimum. And this means anti-poisoning uh, anti -poisoning work together with the police. This means working with the hunters to uh, substitute the lead uh, ammunition uh, to, to non-lead ammunition. This works. This means working with the electricity companies and the power utility companies to insulate um, any potentially dangerous uh, uh, pylons uh, or to put uh, bird diverters to minimize the risk uh, of, um, of collision. So uh, reintroduction and threat minimization have to be very, very closely associated and one does not go without the other. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we're, we're probably on schedule to take a break now, but we can come back to some of the the questions that we've received um, a bit later. There, there's several questions about Corsica, which uh, we may have time to, to try and answer some of those in the second session um, and a couple of others as well. I think we're on schedule to break. Okay, many thanks, Louise. Uh, many thanks to you all from the audience and from the panelists. Uh, before we go to the break, uh, we will have a very short poll. Uh, we are very happy if you could answer uh, two questions that helps for our work. And then we will have a break and start again. Let me see. Uh, yeah, on 15.30. So we will, we have five minutes later, and we start with the poll. See you at fifteen three thirty p.m. Thank you.
So, hello everyone. I hope you had a nice break, coffee break. Uh, as you can see on the screen, uh, Eleni uh, showed the results of our poll. So we have a right young people also attending our conference and we are not really gender biased, that's nice. And uh, most people attend from Euro, but we have also many colleagues from Africa, Asia, Australia and North America. Uh, okay. Many thanks uh, for the contribution so far. Uh, we will start now with the second session. Uh, we are very curious to hear the next talks and I'm very glad that we have our colleagues from Nepal and South Africa with us, which certainly will open or widen our perspective to learn more about the bearded vultures in other regions. Uh, first, I'm very happy to introduce you, Tulsi Subedi. Tulsi is a zoologist from Nepal who, as I heard, is familiar with bearded vultures already since his early childhood. He's director of programs in the Development and Conservation Research Institute of the Himalayan Nature. He also board member of the Nepalese Ornithological Union and a member of the Asian Raptor Research and Conservation Network. He published already several articles on bearded vultures in Nepal. You can find them on ResearchGate too, on different topics, including demography, habitat selection, and spatial behavior. So we are very looking forward to your talk, Tulsi. I give you the word. Thank you very much, Danny. Good afternoon, everyone. I am presenting short updates on the conservation status of bearded vulture in Nepal. The bearded vulture is locally known as hard four in Nepal. So I am presenting about the Himalayas hard four. The hard four is made up from two words. Hard means bone and four means break. So the English meaning of hard four is bone breaker. So I'm talking about the bone breaker. So I, 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 have, I have some technical problem, so I cannot go to the next slide for whatever reason, I don't know. Can you try to scroll with your mouse? That would uh, take oh, the oh, trick okay, for okay, me. Okay, okay. So uh, Nepal is a small country and landlocked country sandwiched between two giant countries, China and India. So I'm uh, showing the location map of Nepal in the globe. And lower part of the Nepal is flat land. Almost 70% of the uh, southern belt of Nepal is flat land. Uh, that means 83% land is covered by small mountains and high Himalayas. So this uh, is the uh, most important habitat for the bearded vulture in Nepal. So there are total of nine species of vulture recorded in Nepal so far. Uh, out of those, bearded vulture, uh, along with other five species, is uh, our resident species. And Cinerus vulture and Griffon vulture are winter visitor to Nepal. And one species, the Indian vulture, is considered vagrant species, only few records in Nepal. So the first record of bearded vulture was made in 19th century by Hoxon and he published the description of bearded vulture in 1835 in Journal of Asiatic Society of Bengal. And he was, at the time, he was collected bearded vulture in Sivapuri mountain, which is at the edge of Kathmandu Valley. Uh, and he collected in November. And highest altitude nest record was in 5,000 meter, which was recently discovered by Montoro in 2020 and lowest altitude 
record of the nest was in 1,156 meter in the Western Nepal. So in the early, uh, un until the late, uh, until the last decade of 2000, uh, 20th century, uh, the bearded vulture was considered common and widespread resident in Nepal. And Inskip and Inskip 1991 described uh, this information on their book called A Field Guide to the Birds of Nepal. And in the last three decades, in the last three decades, the bearded vulture population undergone decline. Therefore, uh, national red list, red data list listed bearded vulture as vulnerable species in national level. Uh, and it is considered there are only 500 individuals remaining in the uh, throughout the country. So uh, this map showing pre and post <clears throat> post 90, 1990s record of the species dark circle means pre 90s record in several ranges of pre 19 records. There is no recent information. Therefore, the distribution range might be getting more narrower in the recent years. So there are only a few studies have been conducted on bearded vulture in Nepal. So uh, the first five studies, uh, five studies shown in blue, they are related to demography of the bearded vulture and the uh, rest are on different aspects like habitat selection, movement, ecology, and impact of climate change. In 1995, Gill et al. counted 76 bearded vulture in the Annapurna region uh, with the density of 0.35 birds per square kilometer. And he concluded Nepal holds one of the largest population of bearded vulture in the world. In the world. So during 2002 to 2008, one study was conducted in the Musta, upper Mustang region of the Annapurna. And the study concluded 25% uh, of annual declines of bearded vulture. And similarly, another study was conducted in the, uh, within the time frame, and uh, the investigator did not uh, believe the population was declining. And similarly, Powell et al. 2016, published another article on folktale and concluded 19% declines of the annual, annual declines of the bearded vulture from the Annapurna range. So uh, looking at this uh, publication, it seems there is a rapid decline of the population of bearded vulture. And recently we studied bearded vulture within the same territory and we estimated 0.18 birds per square kilometer and estimated total population of 122 individual within the part of Annapurna range. So looking for this study, uh, from first study to last study, uh, the population of bearded vulture might have been declined, but uh, the second study and uh, fourth study, they concluded very high decline rate of the uh, population decline rate of the bearded vulture. So they might be overestimating the declines. So uh, if we compare first study and fifth study, so the population of bearded vulture might have been approximately uh, declined by declined by 50% within last 20 years. So uh, due to the, uh, that decline, we intended to understand the movement ecology of the bearded vulture in the Himalayas. So between 2016 and 17, we captured 13 bearded vulture and deployed with GPS transmitter on them. And for that study, we uh, did collaboration with uh, some international organization and some local organization uh, like Peregrine Fund, or Ford Foundation, Korea Institute of Environment Ecology, uh, Kenya Birds of Prey Trust, and Department of National Park and Wildlife Conservation, 
and uh, several local groups. And you can see in the picture, uh, local uh, people uh, were helping uh, during our research activity. So uh, from our tracking study, we found that uh, the bearded vulture used a uh, vast range of the mountains in Nepal uh, and China, uh, showing the combined home range, uh, com combined uh, minimum convex polygon home range was over 68,000 square kilometer. And uh, based on uh, different age classes, our study was consistent with the study conducted in Europe as well as in South Africa. That means adult bird were using smaller home range size and uh, juvenile and immature birds were using really large home range size. And but, however, our home range size um, based, on, based on different age was smaller than home range size uh, uh, studied in South Africa. That means uh, the uh, Himalayan uh, mountains uh, maybe um, may, might have uh, less food supply in compared to uh, compared to uh, Europe, uh, European range like Pyrene Pyrenees mountains, but uh, more food supply uh, in compared to South African uh, region. In our track bearded vulture, uh, they use some part of the China as well, and only 30% uh, home range size uh, was uh, inside the protected areas, protected areas of Nepal. That means um, most of the time our bearded vulture uh, were uh, traveling, uh, spending time outside the protected area in the human dominated landscape. That makes uh, uh, these species are uh, more vulnerable due to different anthropogenic threats. Like persecution, uh, you can see in the left picture, the kids, uh, they uh, they were killing a uh, bearded vulture uh, for whatever reason. Uh, and in the second picture, you can see uh, juvenile bearded vulture dead uh, due to poisoning. So in my study also, I found that poisoning of carcasses to exterminate mammalian carnivore is uh, one of the reason, uh, one of the main threat to the bearded vulture in Nepal. So there, there were, uh, Another uh, threats we identified, uh, like disturbance in nesting cliff and uh, like fire, fire on the cliff. Uh, you can see on the right picture uh, within the circle, there, there was uh, one active nest of bearded vulture in 2017. And uh, the people uh, made fire on that cliff. You can see darker patches. That means uh, these patches were born uh, by fire. Uh, so uh, the bird nest was gone from that uh, that cliff. Uh, similarly, uh, climbing in the nesting area, uh, uh, nesting cliff, uh, uh, for uh, to collect eggs or to collect fabrics. Uh, people believe they collect fabrics uh, from the uh, near uh, near village uh, to make their nest. So people might climbing to those uh, nesting cliffs and making disturbance to the bearded vulture. And another uh, threat is power line. Uh, we have uh, power line uh, running all over the mountain ranges, which are poorly designed. So uh, due to collision or electrocution risk, the bearded vulture, might, uh, my bearded vulture is uh, getting more threats. So uh, another threat uh, to Nepal uh, might be the climate change. Uh, I did climate change uh, model. Uh, the paper is uh, in preparation and uh, the upper map showing uh, the uh, suitable habitat of bearded vulture in current climatic uh, scenario and lower map showing uh, under the climate change scenarios of 2070s. So a lot of the uh, um, range in the southern, southern part uh, is getting uh, destroyed due to uh, climate change um, activity, clim climate change. And uh, it is estimated that 14% uh, 
bearded vulture habitat will be lost uh, from uh, Nepal Himalayas in 2017. So uh, there are only few uh, conservation activities are uh, going on. So bearded vulture is not protected species in Nepal. There are only nine species of birds. They are uh, legally protected uh, by the government. Uh, however, the uh, National Park and Wildlife Conservation Act 1973 uh, um, uh, tells that uh, hunting and killing or injuries uh, to birds inside the protected area is illegal. And uh, for those people who do killing or make injuries to the bird, uh, the penalty is uh, minimum uh, fine is $168 uh, and maximum fine is 421 US dollar or imprisonment between six months to one year. This is, this is the uh, legal uh, um, provision uh, for killing of bearded vulture inside the protected area. But if somebody kill uh, the bird outside the protected area, uh, there is different legal provision. The fine is 168 US dollar and uh, six month uh, imprisonment on or both. So there were uh, two uh, different vulture conservation action plan were made in Nepal. One was between uh, 2009 and 2013. And after that, another uh, plan was made between uh, for 2015 and 2019. So uh, within this plan, there, there were a lot of activities for the conservation of vulture species. However, uh, this, these plans did not specify uh, any activities for uh, targeting uh, for the conservation of bearded vulture. These plans were targeting to uh, remove the NSAID uh, uh, diclofenac, uh, which was uh, identified as a lethal for Asian vulture uh, species. So uh, there, there were not any specified actions uh, for the conservation of bearded vulture rather than some awareness and um, action related to removal of the uh, lethal uh, drug. So our future plan is to uh, develop and train citizen scientist network to report bearded vulture occurrence, uh, breeding and take prompt action on threats at local level. Uh, so in the future, our, uh, we are uh, considering to develop a network of people uh, to take prompt action in the lo local level and uh, to identify uh, threat hotspots and work with the power line companies to mitigate some uh, threats uh, due to uh, the impact of power lines, like um, uh, using some insulator around the poles and on lines and some uh, bird deterrence in the, line, in the power lines, and education campaigns and mitigating threats uh, from poisoning. For, for this, we like to work with the uh, livestock owners uh, to protect their uh, available cattle uh, from predatory animals. So uh, again, we like to track more bearded vulture using PTT units and use those data for the precise estimation and threats uh, to the bearded vulture and conduct appropriate conservation intervention. And we also uh, like to um, collect data on the demographics of the bearded vulture because uh, the, the recent, uh, the existing population estimate is based on the, based on the uh, observation uh, on, uh, within uh, uh, the limited range. So uh, we have to cover vast range of the mountain uh, to know the precise estimation of the population of bearded vulture. So, uh, uh, that was my last slide of the presentation. And I, th I thank everyone for providing me this opportunity to uh, share um, a small update on the bearded vulture in Nepal. Although uh, th there, ha have been, uh, there has been a lot of work conducted in Europe and South Africa, 
and uh, um, bearded vulture uh, work in Nepal Himalayas is just started and uh, we have to learn a lot from Euro European um, conservation organization uh, and uh, South African uh, conservation program. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, many thanks, Tulsi, for, for your very interesting talk. It's really uh, important for us to see. We, we have not a big knowledge so far about the situation in Nepal, and it's very uh, interesting for us to see all your result. I think it's important that we have this exchange on a global scan and can profit from the experience and knowledge we have from all over the world. So thank you again. Uh, I have now the pleasure to introduce Sonia Krüger and Shannon Hoffmann from South Africa. They are doing a presentation together. Uh, Sonia will start. She is uh, working as an ecologist in the Kaizen Wildlife and is engaged since many years in the conservation and the research of bearded vultures in South Africa. Uh, you will find uh, several publications from her who give a very good picture of the situation in, in South Africa. Uh, she is also coordinator of the Bearded, Bearded Vulture Task Force of the EVT uh, Birds of Prey. So I hand over the word to you, Sonia. Thank you very much, Dani. And yes, I'm very grateful to the situation of the pandemic which has enabled us to join you for this meeting. I was lucky enough to be in the field this morning and watch six juveniles feeding at a feeding site. And now I can share more information about the population with you all. Real time. So I thought I'd start just by showing you what our subspecies looks like. I see there was a question in the question box. And yes, the Southern African subspecies looks morphologically different to the European one, as you can see in the picture. And the other cliff nesting vulture in the sub-region of where the bearded vulture occurs is the cave vulture, which is globally and regionally endangered. Uh, we cannot see. Sorry? We cannot see your presentation, Sonia. Oh. You will need to share your screen, please. Okay, I did share my screen, but obviously that didn't work. <laughs> Yes, now yeah, thank you. Okay. My apologies for that. <laughs> so now you can see the South African subspecies of bearded vulture in the photograph, so slightly different morphologically. The occurrence range of the current population is shown in the black dots, just to show you where they occur. They used to occur more extensively in Southern Africa, but the range has decreased significantly over the past decade or so. I'm going to introduce our uh, program and the work that we're doing, as well as some recent review of the demographic parameters of the population, as well as just present some of the monitoring results from this year, and then just uh, share with you our recovery and action plan for the species. So there was a lot of research done in the early 1980s by Christopher Brown on the population, which provided us basically with the baseline data for the species. And our bearded vulture recovery program has been working in the last 20 years, basically monitoring, researching and managing the bearded vulture in southern Africa. The bearded vulture task force was established in 2006. And more recently, we've established a national task force in Lesotho uh, and a national task force in South Africa. So the two countries where the species occurs have their own task forces, but we have a joint task force where we discuss all the bilateral management of the species. We developed a conservation action plan in 2006, and it's the task force's responsibility to implement that plan. The plan was reviewed in 2014 and as a biodiversity management plan, which was enabled in the legislation for South Africa through the environmental legislation. So it was a gazetted plan. 
And this plan was recently reviewed uh, based on the Vulture Multi-Species Action Plan, which was published in 2017. So we based the re revised bearded vulture plan on that to make sure we addressing all the actions that need to be addressed for vultures in Africa. And we've reworked that plan slightly this year into a recovery strategy and action plan. So just to give you an idea of the population size, as I mentioned, we've just reviewed this for this year and looked at the data for the last 10 years and compared it with data that was collated for the previous 10 years. And we found eight new breeding sites of bearded vulture in, the, in Southern Africa. We found 13 sites that were reoccupied, which had previously been abandoned. And we had 19 sites that were abandoned in the last 10 years. So that leaves us with uh, breeding pairs between 92 and 112 breeding pairs, which includes four trios. And the total population estimate at the moment is between 313 and 318 80 birds. And the minimum and maximum comes from the fact that some birds might actually not abandon their nest, they might move to another nest. And, and that's where we get the range in the species and the population size. Previously, our survival rate for the population was really poor, as you see an 89% chance of extinction. Um, that was work done up until basically 2014. And the population growth rate uh, was declining. So I've re-looked at the survival rates for the population this year, and that's using 87 years of data from 22 individuals from eight different age classes. And there's a long list of survival, different percentages of survival rates. We were previously concerned about the low survival rates of adults. Um, adults should have a lot higher survival rate than that, and it has increased slightly. So most of the most of the age classes, their survival has increased in the last uh, five years, but that's probably more due to more reliable and yeah, more data, and that's all from tracked individuals over the last ten years. The productivity of the population is a concern. Uh, it, it's slight. It's basically similar to what was found in the last couple of years, uh, recent publication but 46% productivity. So only 60% breeding attempts in the population and a 77% success rate of those attempts, which gives us a productivity of 46%. So that is of concern. So both the males and the females are holding a territory from about six years, as we would expect. And they only begin breeding at eight or nine years, whereas they could be breeding a lot earlier. And this is, based on a very small sample size of our track birds, but it does give you some indication of what's happening in the wild. Our breeding season is currently still underway. So these are prelim preliminary results. Uh, we haven't looked at breeding success yet because the birds are about to fledge within the next few weeks. So you're very fortunate to have a database of individuals in Europe. We have a database of territories rather than individuals, but we have over 300, between three and 400 territories of which uh, 156 is what we currently monitoring. And of those, we've monitored 44% uh, this year so far, and 45% of these were occupied, which again is, is of a con concern and would, would also relate to the productivity. 79% uh, of the occupied sites had breeding confirmed at them and one site was discovered to have been abandoned. It was a site that hadn't been checked for a while and was now recorded as abandoned. We've also found it important to monitor sites that have been accessed for either the harvesting, which uh, Shannon will discuss in more detail just now, or attaching transmitters to juveniles or where we've put nest cameras into the nest. So we need to monitor what's happening in terms of the breeding activity following that um, access of the nest site. So 37% of the birds have bred in the same nest in the following year. 22% have bred, but they've just moved uh, within the same territory, but to an alternate nest site. 33% didn't breed in the following year, but have subsequently bred. And 7% haven't bred um, for at least two years following um, the nest access. So that is something we'll continue to monitor. In terms of our recovery strategy and action plan, the aim of this plan is to achieve the species conservation objectives. 
And these objectives are to ensure the long-term survival of the species and at least stabilize the population at the current population size, and then grow it to a realistic carrying capacity, which we consider to be 150 uh, pairs, and obviously maintain a positive population growth. The recovery strategy has been revised to be fully representative and inclusive of all the partners and in both countries. We are working on formalizing the agreement between Lesotho and South Africa to facilitate this transfrontier implementation of the plan. Uh, although we've been working together for the last 20 years, we've not formalized it, and that's the, been the focus of this year. So the Bearded Vulture Task Force, uh, which is the steering committee of the Bearded Vulture Recovery Program, they've developed their terms of reference uh, this year or formalized those. And so has the Bearded Vulture Breeding Program, which is a sub-program of the recovery program. They've also developed their terms of reference this year. And in terms of the South African side, the task force is also represented on the national lead task team, as well as the National Wildlife Poison Prevention Group which is really important uh, considering the threats to the species. There's been a number of papers published uh, this year dealing with uh, potential release sites and strategies, looking at supplementary feeding sites, looking at the legal protection of vultures, looking at um, the protection of territories in terms of buffer circles, as well as looking at methods for attaching research devices to these species. So the focus of the way forward uh, is the approval of the strategy and action plan through the transfrontier channels uh, and to formalize this collaboration to ensure implementation. And obviously funding, uh, it needs to be a focus going forward. Uh, basically throughout the, the sub-region, funding sources have dried up quite significantly and been redirected elsewhere. So we do need to put a lot of effort into fundraising. And the immediate focus will be a population viability analysis of the population to inform our captive breeding program going forward. And we need to ground truth reintroduction sites for the species also planned for the future and focus on addressing the threats of which the primary threat is poisoning as well as uh, lead and collision with power lines. There's a number of research projects that are planned on looking at nest images where we've got nests, uh, cameras in nests, looking at the reasons for the low productivity of the population and focusing on the founder population size uh, from the genetic aspect. There is a current research project uh, looking at land use change effects on foraging habitat availability, which will be concluded this year. And there's a number of papers in review currently looking at vultures in general um, on One Health uh, indicators and disease. And just generally our annual monitoring, we focus on our nest sites, on various feeding sites and on implementing the strategy and the action plan. And this is just a, a quick overview of all the partners that are involved in the program across both countries and the various districts and provinces within each country. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, many thanks, uh, Sonia. I uh, will hand over right to Shannon. Uh, Shannon brings 20 years of raptor management and outreach experience to the Bearded Vulture Breeding Program as a director of the African Raptor Center. Uh, she manages the exito aspects of the recovery program in South Africa and has committed the last five years to building up a breeding stock on the species. Uh, Shannon, uh, I give you the word. So thank you, Dani. And um, we'll continue basically the discussions about South Africa from the groundwork that Sonia has put in place here. Um, which was certainly our, our project landscape is a little bit different from Europe in that we're lacking your foliage. We are basically a montane grassland. But um, Tulsi, after listening to your talk, I'm never going to complain about the height of our mountains anymore <laughs> because yours are much higher than ours. Um, but we certainly have beautiful big cliffs um, and deep canyons, and that's where uh, the bearded vultures are making their homes. 
So within the bearded vulture um, biodiversity management plan that uh, Sonia mentioned, we have two objectives that are directly actioned towards the breeding program. The first is to establish a genetic reserve of birds and the target figures that we are working with is 20 to 30 non-related individuals. And then secondly, the hope is to obviously release birds back into the wild in the same fashion um, as you are doing in Europe. So our challenge was how on earth we initiate a breeding program with no birds in captivity. Um, the ability of the birds, well, the, the behavior, the canism behavior that's similar to that of big eagles is something that we've based the harvesting program on and we have access where possible the second egg here. And I include that little video just because it's lovely. <laughs> and uh, as we move forward, um, the next question is how to create viable breeding birds um, without any parent birds. So we use, have used three management principles, basically. We raise the, the chicks together, so, so we socially raise them. Um, we raise with puppets from behind the screens, and we also expose the chicks to a single adult that we happen to have. She's quite famous in our neck of the woods now. Her name is Lissetti, and she's the only adult that we've had in captivity in, in years in the last couple of years. So in the brooders, you'll see up here, for example, that the, the chicks are able to see each other, but they have to be kept separate because of their tendency to um, want to kill each other. <laughs> They're still hardwired to do that as, at that age. Um, obviously, the, the puppet is well known in Europe um, and based on, on the ones that you're using your end of the world um, and used from behind a screen. At 20 days of age, the birds, where possible, uh, the chicks are then transferred outside into an open enclosure where they have access and visual access, but not physical access to Lissetti. So she is acting as a surrogate parent um, and there are a couple of potholes in the rearing enclosure um, where, where the chicks are raised. And the, the, there are um, trap doors in the back of the potholes and you can see this the, the puppet on the right here that is feeding. So from, from the time the birds are, are, the chicks are coming into these potholes, we're starting to wean them off the use of the pu puppet and they are, we try and get them to eat, eat by themselves. The chicks within the pothole are also separated by another barrier. It's a bit, um, uh, it's, this barrier here is actually incomplete. It normally has a top section on it and we just took it down initially for this, for this photo. So every year we are aiming and our annual ceiling for how many birds to harvest is, is determined by the number of chicks that Lissetti could have access to so that we are, so that they're able to see her. Our harvest parameters that we set in place um, were the two, the two main ones are that we should not access the same nest for two years in a row. And then the second one is to try and only harvest second eggs. So for example, we'll just have a look at last year, last year's harvesting results. Um, 58 nest territories were checked under the guidance of, of Sonia and her monitoring teams. There were 26 active territories where birds were actually seen in, in those um, nest areas. 17 of those were thought to be breeding and 10 were confirmed uh, with incubation swaps that, that the monitors were seeing. We accessed, accessed eight nests of which we are able to harvest six eggs, four hatched and two were unviable, the eggs. So basically I, I walk you through this last year's um, harvesting undertaking just to give you an idea of, of what the, the, the figure is at the top that we start with and how many chicks we are ending up with um, at the bottom. So we had three chicks that hatched and one chick um, was actually born with a, with a malfunctioning leg. Uh, so the leg increased in size as the chick grew but it never worked. Um, we have eight program birds in, in, at the moment. So this is just to give you an idea of the last three years that we've been functioning. So 17, 2017, 18 and 19. Um, so interesting to listen to you talking um, when you are so far into your project and we just, so we just beginning here. Um, but basically anything that is marked in, in green is sort of a positive, positive obs observation that was seen and the orange ones are negative on a very simplistic representation. 
Um, but what we are picking up is that, yes, we, we thought that there were maybe 100 active nests um, or breeding pairs, but certainly they're not producing quite like we'd hoped, which I, know, I guess is not a, a surprise considering that our population is not doing very well. So for example, 32% of the nests that we've actually accessed um, have only um, one egg. So that puts a little bit of a hole in our attempt to harvest the second egg. Uh, we're also picking up quite a few infertile eggs and certainly in the first two years of harvesting, we're seeing that the second eggs, there are quite a few un um, infertilities in that second egg, which is it's also an interesting thing to, to look at. So obviously the project is a long-term rollout the same way as the European one is, um, but what's quite nice for us to check ourselves is that we have very measurable annual targets. Um, and we're not making them <laughs> at, at present. Uh, we are, the, the program over the extent of, of, of the period would be perhaps um, separated into three phases. We are solidly in the first phase at the moment, but it's after five years of operation uh, where we are still trying to harvest those initial um, 20 to 30 eggs. Unfortunately, uh, because we've been very slow in getting the numbers that we require, we now, um, some of our birds are heading into the next phase um, where we are needing to pair the birds. Um, and then phase three would obviously be when they are producing um, their own progeny that would could then be released back out into the wild. So looking into the future and trying to uh, check, well, ascertain how we're doing and, and, and what our release prospects would look like. Um, we've got a couple of challenges here. So it's quite difficult to see, but I'll try and explain it to you. The potential pairing, and this is a best case scenario, this table, and it's just on a timing timing scale. The first pair could be, for example, Lissedi, that uh, female we spoke about, and the oldest male who would be Mwesi. Again, best case scenario. Lissedi, for the best of our knowledge, is, is at about 16 years old now. And the, when Mwesi might be old enough to breed, um, he'd be seven years old, which is in two years time. So we've effectively lost um, a decade on the top bird of breeding potential, let's say. So if we go into the second line, this would be the next oldest female. Uh, we've had a shortage of males. It's really interesting to hear that Europe needs males too. <laughs> I don't know what you boys are doing, but uh, we certainly, we need some more boys. Um, and you'll see too here, the age discrepancy between these two birds is four years. So on a productivity level, and I'm just talking just producing eggs and the ability to breed and therefore produce young for reintroduction, we're going to lose four years between these two birds here. So fundamentally what this is showing in, in my mind is that we really have to make a concerted effort to increase the number of birds that we're able to harvest over the shortest period possible. Otherwise the age differences between these birds are just going to not allow us to produce chicks in the best case scenario. Okay, our challenges have been multiple. We've met, we've mentioned a couple and um, we are working cross-border. So we've got CITES permits and regulations which are, which, um, are re refreshed every year. Um, our difficult nest access, uh, it just makes it a little bit challenging. Um, we are finding that the birds in the current breeding station are quite hot. And what we have spoken about in both um, Nepal and, and Europe, we've also spoken about the, the continued public awareness. Um, in this last year, in 2020, as the world stopped turning, uh, we didn't harvest. Uh, our movement restrictions were just too, di too difficult to continue, so we decided that we were not going to. Um, uh, we have concentrated on a lot of the paperwork, which no one likes. Um, so the, as Sonia was saying, the MOUs between the countries have been initiated um, formally um, and between role players as well. So fundamentally, it's a good time for us to reassess and basically, I, th I think our project is at a crossroads. We look at our failures. Some of you who have known us in the past know that a group of us nearly killed ourselves in the past. We also have three chick fatalities, one to aspergillosis, which is a very, very young bird. Um, one was actually killed through the barriers by um, the surrogate female. And then we had a, a, that, that little chick with a, with a bad leg also died. However, if you're trying to keep your hopes up and your morale there, we look trying to, we all look at project successes as well. I guess the fact that we have eight program birds 
can be thought of as a success. I do believe that we have got our harvesting technique down relatively successfully um, and very blessed that of all the nests that we've accessed, none of our actions on those nests have disrupted their breeding for the year that we accessed them. The birds themselves um, are growing and growing up and maturing. And this here is our oldest male and oldest female. And he is trying desperately hard, a little bit over enthusiastically to utilize his nesting material that we've made available. But at least from a behavioral point of view, especially with birds that have been raised in the manner that they have been, this for me would be a hopeful sign. And in the next couple of years, obviously, um, the success of the methods would be revealed and whether they actually do breed or not. So another good part of the project is the community engagement and we are working with people all um, throughout the process of harvesting because obviously these people are living around where, where the birds are living and it's vital that, we, uh, that they are part of our teams, extended teams, and that they are custodian for the animals near they live, where, um, near they, well, around which they are living. Uh, it's cross-border, it's cross-culture, so it's obviously very interesting uh, communications. So we're looking at our eight birds at the moment. We've just from upskilling ourselves from um, our own point of views, we've been learning about the, the malting and aging with the malting and comparing it to your European um, data and publications. And it's certainly very interesting to watch these birds grow. We in fact are photographing them every month. Um, and just comparing it to what, what you know. Um, and that from a personal point of view is interesting to see. Uh, we're also at a stage where our enclosures need to be expanded in number um, as we start to pair the birds in this second, as we move into a second phase. So basically looking forward, what we're needing to do honestly is to either go big or go home. And when I say that, it's, it's we need to commit to the need for the program, the breeding side of things, and then um, basically harvest in order to reach those objectives. Um, as Sonia mentioned, we need to expand our funding potentials and options. And uh, I certainly don't think anyone, uh, we're unique in that case all over the world at the moment. So in order to reach our objectives, we may need to look at our harvest protocols. And it was really interesting to hear with um, yourselves, Alex and Jose, how you were talking about the changes that you have to implement considering the situation. So. It was, it was interesting to hear. Um, with our need to expand the breeding station, we are just investigating the option of possibly moving closer to the, um, the habitat and, and, ra and range of the bearders um, and into a cooler area. And as Sonia, Sonia mentioned, we're formalizing our bilateral agreements and, and project frameworks. So we have so many partners and many, many people are individuals and little of which we are so very grateful, but we've just listed the main big ones here. Um, so thank you so much for your time, everyone, and uh, we appreciate um, being able to share and look forward to hearing any ideas or comments on, on guidance in a way forward for our, for our teams down south. <laughs> thank you, Dan. Many thanks, uh, Shannon. Many yeah, thanks, many Sonia, days. for your really very interesting uh, talks. Uh, that was excellent to hear what you are doing. Uh, having in mind how many vulture species and how uh, vultures in general on the African continent are in a strong decline. Uh, I think uh, it's very, it gives really hope that things can change when such a committed team devotes uh, their full energy to con the conservation of, of the, their vulture population. So many, many thanks for your presentation. Uh, so we are a bit over time. I give the word to Louis Phipps. Uh, Louis is a conservation biologist with a wide experience in vulture research. He works as a research officer in our foundation and will give us now an overview of recent research on bearded vulture. Louis, I hand over the micro to you. You are unmuted, Luis. Hi, 
Hi, everybody. In this presentation, I'll just be covering some of the research that has been published in the last 12 months or so on bearded vultures. Um, it's, it's not an exhaustive overview and obviously won't cover uh, the research that we've, we've heard earlier in the day. But it's just some of the more interesting and, and perhaps important uh, pieces of research that have been published over the last few months uh, from Europe and also further beyond. So the first paper we're, we're going to look at is this um, study on the Pyrenean bearded vulture population, which used long term monitoring data from 1987 to 2016 which used breeding monitoring data and also re-sightings data from marked individuals. And the idea of the study was to estimate the population size and structure of the Pyrenean population in Spain and or in France, and also to generate estimates of survival and breeding parameters. So the main results of this study were that overall the population increased annually 3.3% between 1987 and 2016. But in the last 10 years, the population growth rate decreased slightly and went down to 2.3% increase annually between 2006 and 2016. Overall, the total population was estimated at 1,026 individuals. Of those, 365 were adult breeding birds, so approximately 160 territories. That represented 49% of the adult population, or 36% of the total population. During this period, adult proportion increased from 61% to 73%. And the age of breeding estimated from this study was higher than previous estimations at 10.31 years. 30 to 35% 30, 30 of territories were occupied by polyandrous trios. So that's when usually uh, a, another male joins a pair and uh, joins them in the breeding activity in that territory. So there's three adult birds involved in breeding inside that territory. And the graph on the right just shows the evolution of the population for the different age classes over time. So the study found that the population growth rate was strongly positively correlated with adult survival. And this had a greater effect than productivity did on the growth rate. Subadult and juvenile survival rates had a weaker effect on the overall growth rate. And as expected, based on previous studies, the study confirmed that there are density dependent effects at play, which led to decreases in juvenile survival, decreases in productivity and decreases in adult survival. And this explains the reduced population growth rate observed in the last 10 years of the study as the population size increased, which is shown in this graph on the right. So this has conservation implications. And because of the, these density de dependent effects and the population approaching carrying capacity in the Pyrenees, there have been calls and, and strategies developed in order to use Pyrenean birds to reinforce populations elsewhere in Spain through reintroduction projects. And this next study that we're looking at here actually reviews the effects of some of these proposed strategies on the source population in the Pyrenees. So overall, the study found that there were three scenarios that were predicted to not affect the overall population size in the Pyrenees after 30 years. And these were the removal of five clutches of eggs or and five non-territorial adults during a single year the annual removal of five non-territorial adults during a six-year period, and the annual removal of five clutches during a six-year period. So these three scenarios were estimated to not affect the Pyrenean population size after 30 years. And the graph on the right shows the number of breeding territories over time over the 30-year period for all of the different scenarios that were test, tested. And the red dashed line shows the current population with no intervention at all. So you can see a steady increase in territories, um, whereas the other scenarios, uh, some of them do cause a population decline over time. However, the authors do urge caution when looking at these predictions, because there are many uncertainties in the models, particularly arising from stochastic or, or random changes to survival and productivity, which could cause 
um, adverse effects to the population. And the graph on the right shows that the high degree of variation for these different scenarios. So looking at a, a more local scale in the Pyrenees, this study looked at long term monitoring of the French Pyrenean population from 1994 to 2017. And the main thing to note here really is the, is the fantastic increase in territorial pairs over this period from 16 territorial pairs to 44. The study didn't find a significant trend in productivity, but they did find that the colonization probability increased with populate, breeding population size and also winter supplementary feeding within the territory that, that was eventually colonized. They also found that pairs that had been together less than five years were less likely to lay eggs. There were higher laying rates and productivity inside or close to protected areas. Nest success decreased with earlier lay dates and increased with winter food abundance. And importantly, particularly re related to the previous study that we looked at across the whole Pyrenean population, this study found that nest failures were typically as a result of harsh weather conditions or disturbance. So these are two factors which can quite quickly affect um, productivity over uh, across the population. And there was also no effect of winter supplementary feeding itself on productivity. And these graphs here just show some of the relationships between uh, ter territory productivity, nest success, and colonization probability in relation to those factors that they assessed. So sticking with uh, supplementary feeding and diet, this next study looked at the dominance hierarchy of the four different species which are found in Europe using video recordings of feeding events and quantifying the competitive interactions among and between the four vulture species. And they found that the larger species were more dominant, so cenarius vultures and griffin vultures were dominant over bearded vultures and Egyptian vultures. Um, and also, interestingly, that um, bearded vultures differently to the other species, juvenile bearded vultures were actually more dominant in the overall hierarchy compared to adults and subadults, and that's suspected to be because they spend more time at, at feeding sites and therefore are interacting more frequently with the other species, whereas the adults and subadults are more likely to be finding food away from feeding sites and therefore um, steering away from these agnostic uh, interactions. And of course, as we know, bearded vultures are specialist bone feeders. So unsurprisingly, 75% of the interactions from bearded vultures were directed at other bearded vultures. So sticking with diets of bearded vultures, this study looked at mineral content of, um, of feces and also uh, prey item or food item delivery to nests uh, for bearded vultures to, to really try and assess the importance of bones and also meat to, to bearded vulture diet at, at different times of year. And as expected, the food items delivered to the nest were 65% were, were bone fragments of sheep or goat species, 76% of which were from the bone extremity, so limbs and feet. Um, and, and that's mainly because of the, the morphology of those um, parts of the body of, of the food items were easier to swallow. So bearded vultures tend to be able to swallow bone fragments of 30 centimetres or less, otherwise they need to break them by, by dropping them onto, onto rocks. Um, and interestingly, they also found that 15% of the diet is meat-based, and, and we know that's an important component of the diet, especially during the chick rearing phase. And from a methods perspective, this study showed that direct observations produce more detailed information than the chemical analysis of, of the faeces. So again, using new methods and, and technology to assess the ecology of, of bearded vultures, we're discovering new things on a, on a regular basis. And this study looked at um, nocturnal flights of bearded vultures from accelerometry and GPS data in the Spanish Pyrenees, uh, together with camera trapping data at carcasses. And they found that of the 11 individuals studied, Six of them flew between 0.7 and 6 kilometres on at least 19 different nights, including 37% when the moon was less than 20% illuminated. And interestingly, these birds were not showing feeding behaviour at this time, and so foraging does not explain these nocturnal flights, but rather 
probably disturbance or adverse weather did, but that needs further further investigation. This may be an explanation of why some recovered individuals are showing that these recovered individuals are showing impact injuries at that time. So another insight into beard vultures. Now, finally, moving away from Europe, we're looking at uh, this study in Iran, which used opportunistic observations between 2010 to 2018 to generate a habitat suitability model for bearded vultures in a province of Iran. And they had 24 occurrence records in this time, and they used this to build a species distribution model, which showed that the probability of presence increased with annual precipitation and the distance from roads. And probability of presence was also highest in rangeland with 25 to 50 percent canopy cover. This is important in terms of um, identifying other potential areas where bearded vultures could could be present, and then also directing conservation actions. They also uh, made a first prediction of the potential impacts of climate change on the range of, of uh, bearded vultures in this area, and found that there's potentially quite a severe range contraction due to climate change. And these graphs show the relationship between annual precipitation, distance to road, and probability of presence. Sticking with distribution records again, this interesting study found a, what is apparently the lowest um, altitudinal record of a bearded vulture in Nepal at 1,156 metres above sea level. And this is lower than the previous record of 1,400 metres above sea level, as, as Tulsi has maybe described in his previous presentation. And these birds obviously nest almost up to uh, 8,000 metres in the Himalayas. So this is thought to be the lowest nest record in Nepal. And interestingly, this nest was actually 35 metres from a road, which is in contrast to the previous study, and adjacent to agricultural cropland rather than uh, sort of semi-natural rangeland habitat. So again, we can see that you can predict across wide areas what these birds will do, but sometimes individuals or at a local scale, they do behave very differently. And this time we hear from long, longer term monitoring at uh, in Armenia, and this study shows encouraging a small increase in number of territorial pairs, uh, number of ter breeding pairs, sorry, in Armenia from seven pairs in 2003 to um, 11 pairs in 2019. And again, encouragingly, the breeding success for these birds over this time has, has been high. However, one concerning thing is that persecution for trophies, illegal capture for pets and poisoning at municipal dumps does pose a threat to these birds in Armenia. And this NGO is, is really working hard to reduce these threats, but encouraging nonetheless. Slightly different study now. This study looks at archaeological remains at three sites in southwest France from the Aurignacian period, which is about 43,000 to 26,000 years ago. And these archaeologists found remains of a bearded vulture talon and two wing bones at, at two different sites. And interestingly, um, the, the knife marks on these remains don't suggest that they were prepared for food, but rather potentially for symbolic uh, reasons. So they're not really prepared for food. There's obviously uncertainty what they were being prepared for, but it does also confirm a focus on scavenging birds in this period, potentially due to a close relationship between humans and scavengers in those times. Um, and I think the symbology, we can perhaps be tempted to, to think that they, they did revere bearded vultures and, and other vulture species at those times, which then leads me on to the final study, which I won't go into too much detail for, but it, it's a, a really nice assessment of the role of scavengers, um, including bearded vultures, but also the other vulture species found in Europe about how vultures contribute in a non-material way to people, so through tourism, photography, and so on. It's a really, really interesting paper, and a really great, great thing to do is demonstrate how, um, how scavengers and, and vultures in particular can contribute to human well-being um, and, and beyond the economical advantages of, of conserving them. So there we go. We have quite a variety of, um, of research uh, articles and, and pieces from the last uh, 12 months or so. I hope you've enjoyed an overview. They can all be found online or you can contact us or contact the authors directly if you'd like the, the full texts of those research articles. Thank you very much. 
Many thanks, uh, Luis. Uh, this was uh, really interesting. I think uh, it's a good format to have such a fast overview over these many publications. Not all of us have always the time to carefully read them. So uh, very, very, very interesting to see all these results in this format. Uh, now, before we enter the final discussion round, it's a pleasure for me to hand over the word again to Jose. He prepared a short uh, summary of all the presentations from today. I hand over the word to you, Jose. Thank you very much. Uh, five minutes before the last uh, session of questions and answers, really to try to, to, to wrap up and some key messages from what we've heard. We are, we are getting to the end of our, of our seminar. I just re really would like to, to, uh, to say that I really miss you. I miss the personal contact. This was a picture of last year's meeting in Andorra. I miss uh, our football games. Uh, I miss the very serious and technical discussions that we do have uh, during uh, our meetings, our workshops, and our uh, our conferences. But hopefully, we will will uh, you know get to that uh, next year. Uh, we we do have got more females than males in the birded vulture captive breeding. Um, uh, network uh, here in Europe and uh, seemingly from what Shannon said also in, in, in South Africa. But actually in, in this webinar, it has been really balanced, you know, 49, 50%, really great to see. Um, the most frequent age group was 25 to 34 years old, um, and half of the people in this webinar, and we had, uh, we had at one point 250 participants, were uh, between uh, 25 and uh, for, you know, 45, 50 years old. This is good news, uh, there's a future for breaded vultures, mostly were from Europe. Um, we are an European foundation. Great to see that there was one person from uh, Australia, thank you. Uh, for the OC that uh, um, uh, uh, followed us, disappointed that our Latin American friends and, and the penguins in Antarctica did not follow this birded vulture seminar. I think we need to do some uh, communications focused on an Antarctica very, very soon. Okay, uh, the main message is, uh, well, I think that you, you all um, now uh, really uh, get home that this birded vulture conservation program in Europe is really a very successful uh, story, one of the most successful wildlife comeback stories of our times. It's a project, a long-term project that has been with us for 30 to 40 years, that has really gathered momentum uh, over the times captured the imagination of people, gathered quite a lot of different stakeholders around this idea of bringing um, the birded vulture back to the European mountains. And I liked uh, Shannon's last slide, the dream. This is precisely what uh, the visionaries that started this project 40 years ago had, a dream of bringing uh, the species back to the, to the Alps. It started in the Alps, but is now, as I think you've seen in Europe, a multidisciplinary and continental program from the Alps to Andalusia, from Andalusia to Gran Cos, to Maestrasgo, to Corsica. This actually means that it is growing in complexity, it's growing in scope. Um, it evolved from one project to several projects, and uh, absolutely key to this is the monitoring and the research uh, that underpins the decisions and the collaboration. Mirko and Francisca showed some of the examples of this monitoring and research, uh, and, and Louis as well, the, the monitoring, the IBM network, absolutely key um, to get uh, data that, uh, that then uh, uh, informs conservation action. Um, uh, Louis showed now the research that many researchers do as part of their academic activities on these species, which provide us answers and tools for us then to take um, to take decision. And it's absolutely necessary to approach this in you know with a collaborative approach uh, at an European level. So analysis of movements, analysis of mortality, analysis uh, you know of population demography need to be done more and more at an at an European regional uh, scale rather than at a local scale. 
Captive breeding, uh, I think this is a great example of, of a, a captive breeding network uh, that is actually supporting in situ conservation. If it were not for the, for the, 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 the EP, the captive, the birded vulture uh, captive breeding, we would not be able to have today a breeding population in the Alps and in, in Andalusia. And this is really one of the best examples. Uh, the, the, this captive stock is, is managed in a very proactive and intensive, uh, intensive way. And we have uh, actually developed the, the, the protocols um, the, you know, and the operations. We've tested them and we now have got the know-how and we are providing that know-how, uh, for example, to South Africa uh, and to the program that Shannon and Sonia just, uh, just mentioned. We always need to adapt and uh, this our strategy to face challenges, be it COVID, be it West Nile virus. Um, so this is a, a, you know, a constantly adapting strategy. Um, and I really would like to thank uh, the specialized captive breeding centers, but also the zoos, which are a, an essential part of this captive breeding strategy. And without them, this wonderful story would not, uh, would not exist. Finally, um, or, or just before finishing, threats, threats, threats. Uh, yeah, we can breed birds, we can release birds, but if we do not minimize and if we do not control these threats, uh, uh, these reintroduction projects would not be successful. So continuing to work on these threats, continuing the conservation work on the ground that our partners do is absolutely essential. We have, in, in general, the, 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 the situation with birded vulture is, as you've seen today, is twofold. In Europe, the species is increasing. There were only 50 pairs across Europe in the 1980s. There's now 250 pairs across Europe, including um, a growing population in the Alps, uh, 63 pairs or about 60 pairs in Andalusia, both of them reintroduced, where we reverted extinction. This species was extinct in these two mountain massifs it, they, they are there again. The population in the Pyrenees, as you've just said, from, uh, as you've just seen from a paper uh, that Louis um, reviewed, is also increasing. We are trying to do the same thing on Grand Cors and Maestrasgo. It's on the way. And, and, and the Balkans, the, 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 the reestablishment of the population in the Balkans will come uh, at, at some point. Unfortunately, in the Himalayas in South Africa, the situation is slightly different. It is still declining, uh, both in the Himalayas and in Southern Africa. And in the Himalayas, as Tusi has mentioned, there's a lot of anthropogenic threats in action, uh, and we really need um, uh, to implement conservation activities uh, and, and collaboration among uh, stakeholders uh, in order to revert uh, that uh, declining situation. In South Africa, the, the situation is also not very bright. However, it is very good to see there that uh, at least there is some movement and some action. There is a transborder action plan, an action plan and a strategy developed. Uh, the first steps towards the captive breeding program uh, were established, uh, started in 2015. Yes, Shannon showed us that there's been a slow progress, but it is often the case um, in the beginning. Um, but we do need really funding. Uh, this is the same thing for, uh, for, for the Himalayas and, and South Africa. And I think one of the reasons of the success of the European program is that fortunately we have been able to access some, um, uh, you know, some funding from European programs, the European Union, the LIFE uh, program, regional government and national government funding uh, to invest on buried vulture conservation. And I think uh, the priorities for the Himalayas and, and for South Africa, and maybe we can support um, uh, Sonia Tulsi Shannon is to, to try to really get this funding to South Africa. Really good to that the population viability analysis in South Africa uh, is going to be done as part of them of this action plan, and this hopefully will inform uh, future options for the breeding program. I hope that I, I could really capture the, the, the main, you know, the, the, the framework of where we are with, with bird adventure conservation worldwide. I hope that next year we will meet in person. And if that happens, uh, the meeting next year, the annual Bird and Vulture meeting is going to be in November, as they always are, in Baronnie in France. Uh, we will probably also uh, organize over the next uh, couple of months a few more webinars on these species and on uh, um, other uh, uh, conservation work that the VCF uh, is doing. And I really hope that you found uh, this uh, uh, webinar um, uh, useful. 
uh, I, we still have got some time for some final questions and answers. And I know that Eleni also wants to ask you um, some uh, uh, questions through a poll that soon will come to your screens. Thank you. Many thanks, Jose, for this really excellent uh, summary. I think that really brings uh, the most important results and reflections to the point. Uh, that's very, very helpful. Uh, before we now enter, or before we enter the discussion, yes, uh, I ask you to fill the poll. Take one minute, uh, then uh, Francisca and Luis can organize all the questions, and then we will continue with our final discussions. See you in a minute. moment. Okay, I think uh, we had enough time to fill the poll. So I ask you, Francisca, what questions we have here. Uh, thank you, Dani. Uh, we received quite a lot of questions. Um, some of them have been answered and written in the Q&A session. But um, there were several questions for Tulsi and regarding the method uh, you used to catch the birds, what age the birds were uh, when you tagged them, and also if you tagged any juveniles in the nest. Uh, <clears throat> um, uh, mostly we trap adult birds and immature birds um, away from the nesting sites. And we use uh, noose string trap. Uh, we used those um, uh, cloth line, uh, which were about uh, 100 pound of weight, uh, bearing capacity. And we put bone in the middle and uh, surrounded by those uh, nooses around the bone. Uh, th those nooses are relatively quite safer uh, for the vultures and easy to handle. Thank you. Um, I then have a question for Sonia for South Africa, uh, which was asked actually by YouTube, uh, where our webinar is also streamed. And um, it was asked if there is a, if you have any idea why the wild productivity or the productivity of the wild bearded vulture is so low in South Africa. You're still on 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 mute, on mute Sonia. <laughs> I'm really not having a good technical day today. <laughs> and I seem to be floating in the mountains at the moment too. So maybe that explains it. Uh, yes, so I think the productivity is actually driven by the really high mortality rate. So the mortality rate of adults, a number of our adults have been either poisoned or killed or died during the breeding season, which obviously affects the productivity for that season. So I think it is mainly driven by mortality rather than um, anything else. Uh, there certainly isn't food. We think we, the food productivity or food availability is not a problem. But it's definitely something we need to look into a lot more because, it, it, yeah, it is low. But uh, compared to some of the European figures, it's, it's actually not that low. It's, it's quite similar to some of the figures we're getting in Europe, from Europe as well. What we what we see in our birds from Europe in the pairs is that with increased age and with, with increased number of years paired between a certain female and the male, the reproductive success increases. So that would explain why a high mortality and respective pair turnover um, will will decrease the overall productivity. Beside missing missing partners, but our experience seemed to be really um, key for the bearded vultures. Um, 
another question for Shannon and your fundraising. Uh, also, again, the question from YouTube is, if you would consider a virtual adoption program with a regular updates on the adopted boot, so it's if you consider that, I guess it might be a good funding opportunity. That's it's certainly an option. Um, uh, the person who suggested it, uh, if they can follow up with the links to give us a connection, then maybe we can take you up on it. So maybe you can ask the person. Uh, who asked this uh, question on YouTube to, to get in contact with um, Shannon directly to follow this up. Yes, please do. Um, and then we received for the research on, on the trios, we received uh, two questions. If they're always polyandrous um, and um, also why they're actually doing this. Alex. Yeah, to... Alex can probably give some answers. There, there are um, there's cases of polygyny, so where there's two females and a and a male in from the Central Pyrenees and Italian Alps, and there's probably more. But I, I'll hand over to Alex for this. Well, in principle, it's much easier that the male can in, introduce in a new. Uh, in the uh, already existing territory that, that the female, female are in general more dominant. And that's why in general, will not accept that the enter of a new female in, the, in their territory. And the other, in the other case, males are not so dominant and it's much easier that the male can enter in a territory. Um, if we do have one more question that would, um ask a question again for um, Tulsi. Um, it was uh, noticed that um, the, the nest site or the nest you showed was built also or included garbage. Is this something which is normal um, for, for Nepal or is that rather you know, an exception? Uh, I, I think that that was uh, not garbage, that was a piece of cloth. Uh, Often beer vulture uh, collect a piece of uh, cloth uh, from the nearby settlement. So that, that is uh, quite common. In uh, basically in the middle mountain range, that is quite common, but in high altitude that is not often. I don't know if I can just add to that. In, in South Africa, it's the same. Uh, bits of cloth and bits of blanket and some string is also quite often seen on the nest platform. And I suppose because it's a natural material, not as mostly here in Europe, perhaps it's more synthetic issues. So yes. if, it's, that's, if it's wool or something like that, it's something really typical to collect it. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I guess we do go for a last question here for, for South Africa. Um, and the question is, what is the significance of the bearded vulture in South African culture or cultures? Any? It's not, um, it's not perhaps as strong as in others, although I, I know there's some issues where people actually don't know them to be vultures. They believe them to be more eagle-like because of their because of how they, how different they look to the old world, old world vultures that we have. Um, but generally there is a, a medicinal trade around all the vultures. Um, and there's a belief of clairvoyancy uh, because if something dies, uh, the sky is empty and then suddenly maybe a hundred vultures will come in. So there's a belief that perhaps they will dream um, uh, the future and people will use body parts for that. Um, but I, I don't know, Sonia, if you'd like to jump in here. Um, I'm not sure if I have seen very, I have seen very few bearded vulture parts myself. Um, I've seen more cave vulture parts being used in this manner. They are used for ceremonial purposes in a lot of cultures. So for feathers in a headdress or a hat uh, and just adornment, so that that is definitely a, a cultural use of them. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so we do have uh, one last question, and I'm just picking the very last question here, uh, which will be a quick answer. Do the captive breeding programs uh, use artificial insemination? Um, I guess that's for Alex to answer, please. No, particularly by the bedded vulture, not. And this is due because if you are working with species with a low number of eggs, it's really difficult to get uh, exactly the point when you have to do a, a, in artificial insemination. And second, uh, normally uh, males who are spending a, a good sperma quality, it's very low. That means that most of the descendants will came from the same male. And that's a, a big, that will be a big problem for the genetic variability. So that's why we are not using this method for captive breeding. Thank you. Okay, then I think we are at the very end of our first webinar in this format. Uh, many thanks uh, to the whole team that organized this meeting. Many thanks uh, to all uh, speakers for their interesting contributions. Also, a big thank you to the audience for just being with us, for uh, sending us these many questions. Uh, that was uh, very nice to have such an active audience. So you have seen, uh, Joseph already announced the next physical meeting. I hope that we will meet you, many of you, at this occasion in Barony. Uh, please, for those who are not yet have registered for the newsletter of the Voucher Conservation Foundation, do it. Visit our website. Uh, we can send you the link in the in the, in the chat. And so it remains to say goodbye to all of you. Goodbye. Have a nice evening or a nice morning, wherever you are. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you Thank for you. listening. Ciao a tutti. Bye, everyone. Bye. -bye. Bye.